asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. He was on the programme back in November, and I really enjoyed it. It was one of the highlights for me of 2017, because his area of expertise and his field of research, well, there are many, But what we're going to talk about has become of great interest to me in the last year or so. He's an internationally recognised scholar in in international politics, conflict resolution and US foreign policy. Published many books and papers on, uh, on those subjects. But he founded the Exopolitics Institute in 2005 and the Exopolitics Journal in 2006. In fact, you can read all about him at exopolitics.org. He's published a number of fascinating books, uh, very well-reviewed and best-selling books on this subject. I will tweet out links to where you can read those. And as he mentioned it to us back in November, he said to me, Richie, my brand new book will be out in late winter, early spring, and it's about Antarctica. And indeed, it is out, it has been published, and it's available at all good online retailers. Again, I will put a link out. It's called Antarctica's Hidden History Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs. It's a great thrill to welcome back to the programme, Dr. Michael Sala. Michael, welcome back. How are you? And he dropped out there. Just as I was welcoming him to the programme, he dropped out. Let's get him back. That's a funny one, that, isn't it? Just as I was saying hello, the call dropped out. Well, there you go. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Now, you're not supposed to hear that. Leave a message after the beep. Right, but we won't leave a message. We'll give him a minute and we'll get him back on. He might have stepped outside the room to grab a glass of water or um, or something like that. In the meantime, massive amount of tweets came in, by the way, during the monologue about the John Mann witch hunt that's currently underway in... Uh, it, well, it's not currently. It's been underway for quite a while. Uh, but how that's ramping up, um, we might talk about that. I think we might have Michael now. Um, no, we don't, in fact, have Michael. Do we? No, we don't. There's, there's shenanigans afoot because Michael has texted me to say, try again, Richie, and uh, I have done. But we're getting the old voice message. I don't know. We'll try. I've asked him to call me. We'll see. Can we get it up and running? These are the things that used to terrify presenters back in the day when things go wrong. There could be a, we could do a programme, actually. I could dig out archive material when radio shows go horribly wrong. Michael, welcome. Aloha, Richie. Glad to be here. Aloha, sir. It's very good to have you here. I don't know what happened there. I called you and then I got the voice message and then I called you again and I got the voice message again. But thank God you're here. I gave you such a wonderful introduction, Michael. And then the call dropped out. So oh. It's great to have you back. Uh, congratulations well, on the well, book. Thank you. Absolutely. Let me... Um, uh, re- thank you. Yes, it's... Uh, Sorry, Michael. Go ahead. Yes, it's been a yes, it's a, it's been a, a long project in in terms of understanding what's been happening down in Antarctica. So, I'm very happy that the book's complete, and now that the information that I've uh, gathered over the last year can be uh, you know, discussed and analysed more closely by people, because there's there's really a lot of uh, fundamental shifts in the way we look at the world when we examine what's been going on in Antarctica. Brilliant. Now, it's the third book in a series. Tell our listeners a little bit more about that, about this current series. Okay, the the series is the Secret Space Program book series, and basically it looks at all of the evidence that's come out uh, over the last uh, three years or so about uh, secret space programs. Uh, what has been uh, really extraordinary is there have been a number of insiders that have emerged with uh, a lot of detailed information about these secret space programs uh, built by, uh, developed by the US Navy, uh, developed by the Air Force, uh, developed by uh, a transnational corporate uh, conglomerate. Uh, even the United Nations um, has has a space program, according to some of these sources. So, uh, the book series examines all of these uh, different sources and sees, well, you know, what evidence is there to back it up? You know, what documents, what historical um, 
uh, evidence can we find to support that indeed these uh, programs did exist and have been developed secretly and continue to operate today? And that's the most important thing, continue to be operated today. Now, the, the, the new book, and again, I will put links out to where people can find it. It's, um, it goes back as far as the First World War, Michael, in terms of when, our, when Antarctica comes into the picture. Tell us about what was going on during the First World War and at the end of World War I. Well, um, at the at the end of World War One, um, Germany had uh, lost all its all its colonies, and so there was a, a deep kind of introspection by the German elite in terms of uh, how to rebuild Germany and and regain some of its former glory. Um, and so, people in Germany, um, many people involved in these secret societies, uh, they began to embrace some of the uh, older traditions and uh, philosophies concerning their connection with this ancient uh, inner earth civilization called Hyperborea. Um, and the capital of Hyperborea uh, was uh, Ultima Thule, and so this was the name that this group gave to itself. Uh, they called themselves the Thule Society. And so they began to sponsor and support all sorts of uh, projects to help regain Germany's glory. Um, and one of these was this um, uh, the efforts by uh, Maria Osic, who was a psychic, to establish contact with these uh, uh, otherworldly beings. And so she established contact with this group that claimed to be from another star system, Aldebaran. And from that, uh, the, the Thule Society uh, funded uh, the development, the research and development of some of these space-time uh, devices that uh, Orsich was getting information about. And that became the basis for uh, Germany in the 1920s developing a secret space program uh, that, to begin with, was civilian. I mean, that's important to emphasize that it was a civilian program run by German secret societies with all of these esoteric uh, people like uh, Orsic, along with uh, scientists who were uh, able to combine and integrate this kind of esoteric information with uh, the hard sciences. And so, you know, as a, as a result of that collaboration between mystics, scientists, and secret societies, uh, the Germans by the early 1930s uh, had developed the first prototype spacecraft uh, these were craft that, that could not only fly into space, escape Earth orbit using kind of anti-gravity technologies, but also um, travel through space-time so that they could travel long distances. So these were the very first craft developed in the early 1930s. Um, and 1933, Hitler comes to power, and, and so he begins to subsume all of this into the, the Third Reich. Um, and and then with the opening up of Antarctica in 1938-39, he begins to move a lot of this uh, research and development on these space programs down to Antarctica. Uh, you know, for, for for two purposes. One one uh, was to basically ensure that uh, nothing nothing would uh, happen to the uh, to this research if the war effort uh, turned out bad, and and the other was because uh, there was a need to separate uh, you know what the secret societies were doing um, in terms of wanting to go into deep space. Uh, colonize other worlds with what the Third Reich wanted to do, which was to weaponize these uh, technologies for the for the war effort. And so there was a separation. So Antarctica was kind of like uh, this, uh, this building ground for this uh, future space program that would become a colonial force. This is this is incredible, Michael. So so Hitler and his um, his, his allies in the Nazi party they found out that German, very wealthy German secret society types had managed to either reverse engineer technology to create their own anti-gravitational spaceship. You're touching on really, really interesting stuff here now because you mentioned the weaponization. You would have assumed that the Nazis did everything they could 
to commandeer that and to use that in the war effort against... Because, of course, it ended up fighting a war on two fronts, um, you know, fighting, obviously, eventually, um, you know, fighting Russia, of course, in the east, and then, you know, obviously fighting the Allies in the west. Why wasn't Hitler successful, Michael, in doing that, in using that technology? Well, uh, one of the important things to keep in mind here is that uh, Hitler was not the ultimate ruler of Germany, as as many people mistakenly assume. Uh, he was a totalitarian uh, leader, but he was put in place by these German secret societies who uh, also formed the elite leadership around Hitler. So Hitler was m- more or less... Um, someone that was was given um, clear marching orders in terms of uh, the, the kind of areas that uh, he had responsibility over. But the German secret societies, when it came to uh, certain things like the economy, uh, c- certain areas like uh, Antarctica, they really ran the show. So it was these German societies that ran the show in Antarctica and the German economy. Uh, Hitler uh, certainly um, started the war effort, but I mean, a lot of the war effort, uh, you know, brought massive profits to German corporations and yes. these uh, leading industrialists. It was just uh, when Hitler started to make some really bad choices, uh, like declaring war on the United States, uh, starting war against the Soviet Union without having ended the war in the Western Front, and also um, ignoring uh, the requests to use some of these advanced technologies for defensive purposes, as opposed to his idea that somehow um, some of these advanced technologies could be used for uh, building strategic uh, jet bombers that could uh, basically bomb the United States, you know, bomb New York and so forth. So uh, as a result of all of these things, um, Hitler, Hitler's poor strategic choices led to um, the Third Reich losing the war. But the German secret societies, I mean, they had securely uh, established themselves in Antarctica. And, and, and in 1944, when it was clear that the war effort was lost, uh, they had convened a secret meeting in Strasbourg, uh, France today, uh, where German industrialists met with Martin Bormann, who was the deputy Führer, and basically a, a plan was uh, uh, set upon, it was, was developed whereby all, as much of uh, the industrialist uh, power, uh, finances, resources and so forth would be shipped out of Germany to safe neutral countries or friendly uh, allied countries and basically uh, after the war ended that Germany would rebuild itself um, into an economic power and through economic means establish a fourth Reich and so you know, when you combine the German industrialist power that was allowed to escape uh, the, the collapse of the war it, it, by relocating a lot of resources, personnel and capital to other countries as, along with what was going on in in Antarctica, you had a basis for the Fourth Reich re-emerging secretly. Michael, this is great stuff because you're talking about companies like Hoyxt, uh, IG Farben, Basf and others, these massive industrialist pharmaceutical giants that initially backed um, Hitler to the hilt because they wanted a post-World War II world with fascism reigning so that they could enjoy the spoils of the uh, you know the spoils of a world controlled by basically a single government so this is fascinating stuff this so all these guys then they escaped as you said basically punishment they escaped any consequences for having supported the Nazis and what the Nazis were doing where by the way folks Michael Dr. Michael Sala is on the line we're talking about Antarctica's Hidden History, Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs, Volume 3 of the Secret Space Program series. It's Michael's latest book. It's just been published. Um, there's already some terrific reviews for it. You can find it, of course, on all good online retailers. Do check it out. Now, Michael, while all of this was going on, were the United Kingdom and the United States governments in the loop? Did they know in the early 1930s that the German secret societies had reverse engineered or had designed a spacecraft and were they aware of what was going on in Antarctica? 
Uh, there, there was that awareness. I mean, one of the things that, again, it's worth emphasising is that you know there has always been close co cooperation uh, between US corporations and German corporations uh, throughout the 20s and 30s. Uh, major US corporations, banks and so forth, uh, the Rockefeller family uh, is well known, the, the Bush family uh, was also involved, um, and some of the major, major German companies like the Th Thyssen family, the yeah. family uh, all of these guys w w basically formed a kind of international fr fraternity of industrialists that were basically helping Germany uh, rebuild after the devastating uh, first world war so so this was really what was uh, uh, behind this kind of reindustrialization of, of Germany so so there was a lot of cooperation there between uh, the leading corp uh, leading companies um, and they they basically saw the connection between themselves as, as really being in, in many ways stronger and deeper than their national affiliation. Right. And so during the Second World War, you, you, had, you had a number of American companies that continued to work with Nazi Germany throughout the World War. Um, and, and they actually had exemptions from the Roosevelt administration. So, for example, uh, International Telegraph uh, and Telephone Company, IT&T, had uh, received special exemption to have uh, its subsidiaries continue to operate in Nazi Germany during right? the war. Wow, that's very and interesting, that, Michael. What you're saying here is, is so relevant to today because you're saying that sovereignty doesn't matter to these people. To these elite sovereign nations, doesn't matter. They cross borders and do whatever they bloody well like, right? That's what we're saying here. Uh, that's absolutely correct, Richie. It's a transnational elite. And yeah. We need to really understand that this transnational elite, even though they may be born and bred and, and raised in a particular country, their primary allegiance is to, to their class. And, and this is what we saw that happened in Germany um, as a result of uh, the cooperation between the German companies and the uh, US companies. And after the defeat of Germany, um, the and and the kind of establishment of this Fourth Reich uh, through uh, companies, German companies having established subsidiaries and outlets in South America and in Antarctica, uh, the cooperation with uh, U.S. companies began again um, and deepened because now the Germans had developed all of this really incredible advanced technology in Antarctica and they were flying spacecraft out of Antarctica to the moon, to Mars, wow. they were flying their craft all over the United States and um, Amer American companies wanted a piece of that pie so they formed a partnership with the full blessing of the Eisenhower administration. Michael, there's a lot of tweets coming in with questions and comments. We'll, 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 we will get to them, we'll leave them for now. Dr. Michael Sala is live on the line from Hawaii. It's great to have him back on the programme. Spoke to him back in November. Um, I, I make no secret that this area of uh, expertise is, is, is of great interest to me. I've become very interested in this in the last year or so. I really have. I, I, I've always been honest. I would have been very dismissive of this type of thing in the past. Not rudely, but I would have been dismissive of it, but not anymore. Antarctica's Hidden History, Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs. Now, Michael, they didn't choose Antarctica because it's out of the way, because it's a million miles away from, from anywhere. There were other special reasons why they chose Antarctica. Am I right? Uh, there, there are other reasons, and Antarctica was a, a place that has an ancient history too. Um, there are a, a number of uh, hidden bases in Antarctica, and one of the things that the that the Germans uh, were helped in uh, was finding some of these ancient bases uh, where they could build uh, their own bases that would be the the centre for this uh, German secret space program out of Antarctica. And so there were uh, technologies, ancient technologies, uh, dating back uh, tens of thousands of years but, uh, old uh, that were these uh, civilizations that the, the Germans were aware of. And later on, with the collaboration of the U.S. military-industrial complex, um, the uh, transnational corporate 
uh, conglomerate, uh, this fusion of German American companies with other friendly allied countries such as Canada or Australia, um, they began to uh, develop this uh, network or this very powerful program in Antarctica uh, where they would study all of these ancient technologies that had been left um, in Antarctica. And so this is uh, one of the areas uh, that continues to be of interest because it's it's like these technologies provide uh, us, the, the rest of humanity, a means of being able to supersede or overcome the kind of fossil fuel industry. And this is something that uh, the Germans were aware of from um, very early on. There's so much in this, Michael. There, there, there are so many aspects to this. Obviously, keeping people in wage slavery and, you know, you and I spoke briefly last November, you know, about energy and free energy. We, we, we're we going to talk about these ancient bases in Antarctica, but I want to take you back to something you said a couple of minutes ago, and that is that 80, 90 years ago, they were using these engineered spacecrafts to go to the moon and to Mars. Now, what were they doing on Mars, Michael? And tell us about the evidence that you found that shows that they did make it to Mars. What was going on with them travelling to Mars 80, 90 years ago? Well, the, the first person to actually start coming out saying that the, the Germans had uh, had sent spacecraft to Mars was Vladimir Tuzinski. And, and, and what he did was he came out in 1991. He was a a member of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. He was uh, an engineer, and he had come across uh, papers, uh, now SS papers, uh, detailing um, the German space program. And, and this was something that he, re- he released um, in lectures, a number of lectures um, in the early 1990s. Now, you know, people widely ignored him because they thought it was preposterous, the idea that the Germans had, had uh, uh, escaped and established this, uh, these bases in Antarctica where they were able to fly to the moon and Mars. But Tuziski did have a number of documents, um, and it's well known that um, as after the end of the Cold War, a, a lot of the secret files that the KGB had uh, were released um, and basically sold to the highest bidder. So a bunch of these papers get released, and, and Dzinski, um discussed them, and he showed the papers um, in in his uh, lectures. And so you, you got to see um, the uh, test files on uh, the, the various prototypes that the Germans had succe- successfully developed, like the Vril series of craft and the Hannibal series of craft. And he, he um, these documents basically outlined the, the number of prototype craft that were developed, uh, the number that were tested, and, and some of the German companies, uh, which is all, um, the German companies that uh, provide develop the different technologies for these um, for these spacecraft. So, so this is what uh, Tuzinski described uh, that he came across in the early 1990s. And now we fast forward uh, to, to the recent era, and we have people like William Tompkins, who was a former. Um, covert operative for the U.S. Navy, and he released uh, a bunch of documents showing that uh, he was part of a covert Navy operation that had embedded Navy spies in Nazi Germany uh, throughout the Second World War, and that uh, they were reporting back about the these advanced uh, technologies, aerospace technologies that the Germans had built, and that uh, they, that the Germans had successfully relocated a lot of these technologies into Antarctica. So, so Good has supplied, um, sorry, uh, Tompkins supplied uh, his documentation and some some uh, descriptions of the craft that the Germans had developed. And uh, later we have uh, people like Corey Good and Clark McClelland, uh, other uh, insiders that have knowledge of these uh, secret space programs saying the same thing, that Antarctica was a place that the Germans had successfully relocated to and had built a huge functional space program. Incredible. And, and they were able to go to Mars and the moon. And this was years before the United States um, Apollo missions to the moon, mm. which must have bemused everybody who was involved in those um, experiments and those flights from 
from Antarctica. Dr. Michael Sala is live on the line. I'm going to just read a few comments there um, because a lot of them have have come in understandably on Twitter. You can tweet at Richie Allen Show to uh, make a comment for Michael. Um, Omari tweets, Richie, can you ask Michael to clarify that they flew to Mars and how? That came in a few minutes ago, so Michael has answered uh, that there. Martin in Spain said this could be a connection to Archons and the overall control system uh, there. That's um, um, Martin. Thanks for that, Martin. A number of people have talked about Alistair Crowley and uh, asking about his involvement in this. Jeff tweets, it's rumoured there's a hole into underground bases in Antarctica, that there's some hole or some doorway to these bases. We'll come to that uh, in a minute as well. David tweets about Crowley as well. Was Crowley really MI6 sent to infiltrate these secret societies? Um, Massive amount of comments on it. Green Sky tweets, uh, that's about Jeremy Corbyn and the Zionists. Uh, Let me just scroll on down there. A lot of comments about the 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 space program as we know it today and is that just a front that's a great question isn't it michael nasa and its programs today are those just nonsensical programs designed to keep people thinking that where we are now is we're still struggling to send people to mars we're still struggling to you know send people further afield than the moon that's a great question so so we'll we'll, we'll deal with that for a minute go ahead so that is a good question uh, because NASA, I, I uh, do agree, uh, is a cover program, but it's really more of a cover program for the Fourth Reich's space activities. Because when you look at the extent of NASA programs um, and you look at the people that rose to senior positions in NASA to begin with, from the from you know, NASA was formed uh, 1959, 1960 by President Eisenhower. And the people that uh, went into senior positions in NASA were Germans, uh, which you know sounds incredible now to think of it. But you know, uh, you you had Ver von Braun who was in charge of the Marshall Flight Center. Uh, you had uh, Kurt de Bus, another Nazi involved in the V1, V2 rockets out of Pennemunde and Nordhausen. He was the head of the Kennedy Space Center. So you had a bunch of these German scientists that were heading NASA. Uh, and it's like, well, why were they there? And it's like, on the one hand, uh, sure, they were the undisputed leaders in rocket propulsion technologies. So that's why they had these prominent positions uh, in the uh, in NASA and previously with the U.S. Army missile program out of Redstone, um, uh, Alabama. Uh, but. I think really when you dig a little deeper, what you see is that um, this was really a cover program because the Nazis, or the, you know, von Braun and de Boos, they understood that uh, there was a more more advanced space program operating in Antarctica, and their job through NASA was to provide a cover so that way people wouldn't ask questions about, you know, strange things uh, that were being observed or flights to the moon or Mars or or Jupiter or the, or, or the, or the you know, Saturn and the different moons of these planetary objects, that uh, all the activities uh, that uh, astronomers or amateur uh, astronomers could observe through their telescopes uh, pertaining to these planets that might signify secret space program activities, all of these things could be explained in terms of NASA. Um, And so I think NASA has, from the very beginning, been a cover program for the secret space programs, and in particular for the Fourth Reich's secret space program out of Antarctica. Yes, it's just amazing the idea that they would be there to make people think that if it's if it's a snakes if it's a snakes and ladders board, NASA is there to make us think that we're on square five or square six. But in reality, because of what's been known secretly, we might be on square seventy five or seventy eight. It's extraordinary. Michael Sala is our guest. Do uh, check out exopolitics.org. We're talking about the brand new book, Antarctica's Hidden History, Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs. Go to exopolitics.org. You can order it from there, but uh, it's available at all good online retailers as well. So, Michael, when the, we're going we're gonna to take a break in a minute and then come back and talk about the all the, the, the ancient stuff that was already at Antarctica. Presumably, when they were discovering things in Antarctica, as well as finding out how to make these, 
this might sound like a stupid question, but as well as finding out, out how to engineer these crafts, they also found out how to navigate space and not be affected by radiation. But that's a stupid question because the craft building itself was, um, they were building craft that were designed to protect bodies from from radiation. That's, I suppose, the obvious answer. And when they got to Mars, what did they do there, Michael? Did they leave any evidence that they were there? Well, um, the, the first trips to Mars, um, according to Tuzinski, uh, were unsuccessful. But by by the late 1940s, uh, they had successfully established uh, bases on Mars. And uh, through um, a long series of uh, uh, trials and experiments, they were able to establish uh, bases on Mars and in the underground regions of Mars. Uh, they were able to find uh, lava tubes. I mean, this is one of the things, uh, Richie, that you know, we really need to appreciate that um, not only the Earth, but Mars, the Moon, and many planetary bodies have very extensive lava tube systems. Um, and so if you know what to look for, um, when you find these lava tube systems, you can actually go in there and build uh, bases. I mean, they're very safe from the external environment uh, because Mars at one point was a very volcanic uh, planet. I mean, the biggest volcano on the planet, Olympus Mons, is – sorry, uh, biggest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons, is on Mars. So that, that has an extensive uh, lava tube system throughout Mars. So uh, the, the Germans were looking for these lava tube systems where they could – enter in and establish bases and so that was the that was where they first began establishing bases in the 1940s and, and 50s and and then uh, by the late 1950s after agreements were reached with the uh, Eisenhower administration um, and they had an infusion of uh, people and resources uh, they could build out these bases um, on Mars and so essentially that's what happened and and to begin with, uh, the, the Germans understood uh, the, you know, there were two ways to get to Mars. One, of course, uh, was rocket technology, um, and they used some of their Hanabu 3 craft to fly to Mars because they're capable of kind of inter interplanetary travel. Um, and they also used portal technology. Um, the, 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 this is one of the things that uh, the, the Germans uh, began understanding from the very beginning uh, from the 1920s when they began uh, being given information about space-time uh, travel, that they began to understand how space-time works and, and how if you generate a sufficient large uh, kind of torsion field, uh, you can actually disrupt space-time, and so you can actually move through space and time. And so they, so they became uh, familiar with uh, portal systems, uh, so you could actually, on, on Earth, uh, create a portal or find a portal and, and tinker with it and basically come out on the other side on Mars. So apparently this is one of the things that the Germans learned about um, during their their research in these areas, so by the 1950s, uh, the Germans had built uh, bases on on Mars, um, and and these were expanded with U.S. Uh, corporate assistance. And by the 60s and 70s, these bases on Mars uh, became so um, developed that um, later on, uh, you, you you had a lot of uh, people being taken from Earth uh, to to basically populate these bases and to bring a lot of scientific know-how so that these bases could become self-sufficient and become uh, a kind of economic power in their own right. So when we you know, fast forward to the present day, uh, these bases on Mars that were established in the 40s and 50s by the Germans and then the Americans in collaboration have now become self-sufficient and in, and in many ways are autonomous. So they, they are... Uh, kind of like a, a power unto themselves at this very moment. Michael, we're going to take a very quick break. When we come back, because um, we'll, time has flown by already, and there are some really interesting questions from our listeners that I want to get into. And um, we've probably got, with your permission, another 25, 30 minutes uh, today. So I'm going to take a very quick break. Dr. Michael Sala is our guest. The book is um, Antarctica's Hidden History, Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs. 
Um, fascinating stuff, this. It's about 90 seconds to two minutes, Michael. If you want to grab uh, a glass of water there or something, you've got time to do that. I'll read some tweets when I come back anyway. Very quick break. More with Dr. Michael Sala in, uh, in two minutes. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Introducing the H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. Asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show live on Fab Radio 2 in Manchester. We're on TuneIn Radio as well, TriggerWarning.tv and richieallen.co.uk. It's exactly eight minutes past the hour. Dr. Michael Sala, Exopolitics' own Dr. Michael Sala, is live on the line from uh, Hawaii. We're discussing his brand new book, Antarctica's Hidden History, Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programmes. Fascinating stuff, this. It really is. Michael, thanks for staying with me. Questions and comments are flying in, and they're very interesting. I have um, one from Liz about the moon who asks me to ask you, what does Michael think about the moon? Is it real? Is it a spacecraft? Is it hollow? Um, You can be as quick with these answers if you want, Michael, because there are four or five of these questions. What do you think of the moon? Is it a space station? Is it hollow? What is it, Michael? Um, It really is an artificial body that was uh, brought into Earth's orbit uh, several tens of thousands of years ago, and it was a base, and it has extensive uh, underground facilities, uh, caverns, uh, and uh, it is populated uh, not just by uh, various secret space programs, but also different extraterrestrial civilizations. Really interesting stuff, that. It kind of aligns with some of what David Icke has talked about to me over the years about about um, about the moon. John Kerr tweets, Richie, what does Michael think of, or has he heard anything about a pyramid under Antarctica? And finally, why does Michael think that so many heads of state and religious leaders, why have they visited Antarctica? This is great, of course, because, of course, this it's why it's so fascinating. It's why Michael has written this book. What about a pyramid, Michael? And what about the, the rush of state leaders to Antarctica in recent times? Well, that's a really fascinating question. Um, Pyramids, uh, things that have been found in the ancient world all over different continents, and they are in Antarctica. Um, Now, they, for the most part, are buried under miles of ice. So, uh, you know, the the various structures that people see on the surface through Google Earth, uh, many of these uh, might just be geological formations, but you know the, the, the major pyramids are under the ice, and this is uh, these are the things that are being uh, discovered in secret excavations, uh, because the uh, the 
uh, beings in Antarctica uh, did use these uh, for various purposes, um, technologies, power generation, kind of like uh, life extension. Um, and there have been a lot of visitors, VIP visitors to Antarctica since 2002 uh, who have been taken on tours to see some of the ancient uh, ruins, the, the pyramids under Antarctica, uh, the artifacts that have been found down there. Um, and, and these uh, VIPs have been given a kind of heads up so that when the disclosure happens, that they'll be part of that initial group of kind of experts or reliable witnesses that can assure the public that, you know, things are fine, it's okay, they've been there, and that these are kind of marvels um, and they can help uh, our civilization advance pretty quickly. I did mention last time we were on, Michael, I, I always put my cards on the table. I, I, I'm very interested in your area of research and I, I've, you know, I've come to understand so much of what I was brought up to believe is in fact nonsense. And I did say earlier on that I would have been dismissive of this field of research in the past. Now I'm very interested in it. I'm very open-minded about it. But as usual, you know, when you do programs like this, there are people, and they're polite to be fair to them, they say, Richie, this is a bit mad, this. It's going way over my head. Uh, this is really hard to swallow. You've had this, Michael, your entire career because, of course, you come from a very academic background, of course, as well. When people say to you, I just can't get my head around this, this can't be real, do you listen to that, do you entertain it, or do you just kind of move on? How do you deal with that? Oh, well, I think it's always a fair question, like what's the evidence? Um, but I, I, I understand uh, you know, from my background uh, working in human rights uh, conflicts around the world that often you know, the evidence isn't there or that you can't find it. Not that, not that evidence doesn't exist. It's just that you, uh, as a researcher or when you interview witnesses, uh, uh, eyewitnesses, for example, or people who have been subjected to this, you know, the, the evidence isn't there. So you're interested in the truth, you know, what happened to them. So I think the situation is the same with these insiders, these people who say, you know, like Corey Good or like uh, Dr. Pete Peterson, uh, who say that they've been to Antarctica as part of these covert operations. Um, and they don't, they have really incredible stories to share about what they saw. Now, they don't have the evidence, but, you know, to me, it's like, okay, that's that's just one of the things, one of the difficulties we uh, have to handle. Uh, but, you know, the truth is still there. I mean, the, the truth isn't, doesn't disappear just because you don't have evidence. You can always find the truth. You just have to exercise common sense and you need to be kind of like very discerning. And, and I've tried to do that as much as I can with people like Corey and uh, Pete Peterson and, and the others like Dzinski and Clark McClelland and the other insiders who have information about and uh, about Antarctica. But you know, the thing that I take a lot of encouragement from is that recently uh, many scientific papers have been released about Antarctica, about cavern systems in Antarctica, uh, about uh, the thermal heating that occurs under the ice in Antarctica which substantiates, you know, what uh, Bill Tompkins, Corey Good and the others have been saying. Do you know, I've had a tweet from Mwinga. This is really interesting. By the way, Dr. Michael Sala on the line, Antarctica's Hidden History, Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs. Michael, I really like that answer because it ties into, I did a lot of um, reading and listening to talks that you'd given in advance of our conversation in November. And I came to like you a lot in your style. You're very honest about what you've got evidence to demonstrate and what is speculation. And I think that's probably why people um, like listening to you and like reading you. It's a great way to be that. Uh, and, and, and I love it. That's why I'm interested in you. I mean, I'm a journalist. I'm an academic mind. or I am academically minded myself. I'm drawn to you because of your refreshing honesty about what's out there in terms of what you can prove and what you can't prove. It's really good stuff. Here's a fascinating tweet from Mwinga. And he sent me an article that was published in the New York Times in 2015 that said, back in 2015, 1.5 million African Americans were missing. And apparently somebody called Dick Gregory um, and one or two others suggested that these men may have been repatriated to 
whether it's a colony somewhere else, whether it's off planet or whatever. And I know that's wild speculation. But if 1.5 million black men were missing in 2015 African Americans, it, it begs the question, where did they go? Michael, have you heard that? And have, are, are you aware of the speculation that these men might be part of some program? Uh, I, I have heard that. It's actually a very disturbing part of this research that I've been doing into secret space programs, that, that many people have been forcibly taken um, into these programs and used as unwilling uh, subjects in experiments or used as forced labor in various industrial programs or even worse, uh, basically traded as slaves in a in a in the galactic slave trade. Wow. Because you know, when you when you think of it in terms of, you know, what would be the currency? What would, what is the universal currency? If there are other civilizations out there in the in the galaxy, what would be a, a useful form of currency? Genetics. And see, we on Earth, we have a really varied genetic pool. So, so this is one of the things that um, it can be traded. Um, and I think this is what's been going on. And certainly, there have been a number of insiders, um, you know, that have that I've mentioned in this book that talk about a galactic slave trade, that talk about um, for the, um, on Mars. Uh, Antarctica, um, and even and even uh, there are research and development uh, areas in Antarctica where these uh, transnational corporations build up facilities or build bases where they have uh, you know, up to ten thousand. Imagine this, Richie, up to ten thousand abducted humans from around the world put into these simulated environments, and they're sub- subjected to some experiment whatever that is, uh, biological, some kind of social mind control experiment. And at the end of the experiment, I mean, these people are terminated. I mean, this is, it's, I think this is what's happening They'd be to murdered. a lot of the missing people. They'd be murdered. Yeah, they, and if anybody thinks that, yeah. people wouldn't do that. There are hundreds of thousands of people murdered a year by our governments, directly, not indirectly, um, by, by psychopath, psychopathic personalities who walk the corridors of power, who don't care about people in Yemen, who don't care about people in Libya or in Syria or anywhere else for that matter. So um, I could get my head around that. Uh, We've got, Michael, for another 10, 15 minutes, there are an enormous amount of questions. Um, I'll get to to one or two more if I can, but we're talking about his brand new book. Go to exopolitics.org, by the way. Uh, the book is Antarctica's Hidden History, Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs. It's volume three in the Secret Space Program series. Michael, presumably somebody, we talked about these secret societies earlier on, somebody figured out that there was something special about Antarctica. Have we been able to narrow down who that was? Because this information was buried deep in the ice from what you're telling us for a long, long time. But in, in modern times, and of course 100 years ago, is still modern times or 150 years ago. Did somebody come across this, Michael? Was there one man or one woman or was this stuff passed through the elites? Was it passed through their generations from, you know, from fathers to sons and so on, so on? Well, I I think that in terms of um, Antarctica as a place for human colonization, for, that the first the first evidence that I found of that was uh, from a 1936 uh, document that the that the German that the Third Reich had put out for colonizing Antarctica. So this is in the, in the 1936 during the Olympic Games or that that year that the Germans came out with a plan uh, that Antarctica would be the place for a future German colony. Um, and so uh, this is where, you know, we get the influence of the German secret society. So the Thule Society uh, and some of the other more secretive groups. Uh, some people mentioned Alistair Crowley early on. Um, you know, the, he's connected to the Black Sun Society. Uh, th- this is a kind of like very uh, kind of very esoteric dark uh, group um, that were part of the German secret societies. So these people uh, decided that Antarctica was a place that they wanted to to establish 
future colonies. And I think it's because they knew that their ancestors, that the ancestors of all of these uh, uh, secret societies came from Antarctica. So this is one of the things I discuss in the book, like the idea of the fallen angels. Well, who are the fallen angels? You know, that's this, uh, discussed in the book of Genesis. It's discussed at, at length in the book of Enoch. Um, and who are the fallen angels? Well, these were uh, these were beings. Uh, these were beings from Mars who had uh, um, crash landed in Antarctica uh, as much as fifty thousand years ago, and they then began to establish worldwide colonies. And uh, as a result of their colonies, they uh, they began to interbreed with humans in these various colonies and created a kind of hybrid race. And the and this hybrid race are the origins of the secret societies. And these secret societies know that Antarctica is the is is the birthplace of their kind of global culture as it was first established 50 60,000 years ago and so so when when germany reached a sufficient level of kind of technical scientific uh, knowledge they wanted um, the third reich to basically establish these bases in antarctica because they wanted to find the artifacts of their ancestors Again, massive amount of uh, tweets coming in. Folks, if you want to see what other people are tweeting, go to twitter.com where it says at where it says um, search Twitter. Just put Richie Allen show. Uh, that's all one word. Press uh, enter. Michael is on Twitter, by the way. I tweeted Michael today so you can find my tweet to him on my Twitter. It's at Michael Sala there. Follow uh, Michael there as well. Um, let me just read it. Was it Kat who tweeted from uh, Edinburgh? Kat, who says, um, I believe pretty much everything Michael is saying, but I'm not yet convinced that they were able to go to Mars or the moon, says Kat. Thanks for that, uh, Kat. Yeah, it was Kat in Edinburgh uh, who said that there. She's um, fascinated by this. Ian tweets, if the Apollo missions were real, how do the rockets propel in the vacuum of space? I suppose that's a good question, Michael. Not to be rude to Ian, it is a good question. Rockets propelling in the vacuum of space, how does that work? Well, that just operates on uh, well-understood Newtonian physics. For every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So when you expel uh, liquid propellants at a very high velocity at the back of a rocket, that will propel it forward. And so um, even though you're in the vacuum of space, just uh, Newtonian laws of physics do apply. Omari tweets, Richie, I've seen the Dick Gregory interview with him saying that about the black men going missing. A lot of black men have been going missing for years. It's the genetics that they want, like Michael says. Michael is spot on, says Omari. Dick Gregory ran for president of the United States. Do have a read about that. Liz Froud James tweets, children go missing too, Richie. Is this relevant? Children do go missing. And we know that thousands of children who have been put into care, taken from their families, do go missing in this country. What about the UK, Michael? We've talked about the United States and we've talked about the um, Germany, of course. What about the UK, which fancies itself and has fancied itself for centuries as, as an empire, as a great power, a great player in world politics? Does the UK have any input into what's going on? Oh, definitely, yes. The, the UK is uh, a major player in the secret space programs. Um, they have been a, a, a partner for the United States from the very beginning in sharing uh, a lot of the technologies uh, that they had uh, gotten into their possession uh, during the Second World War. They shared a lot of the intelligence data about the, the Germans in Antarctica. Uh, the, the, the British sent um, special, uh, what is it, the SAS down to Antarctica 1945-46 to kind of like find the, the German bases down there and get control, but they were unsuccessful as was Operation High Jump. But but here's the thing, uh, Richie, and I'm sure you've covered this before with uh, David Icke, is that uh, you know Britain has a long esoteric history um, and that uh, and, and because you had German secret societies that were behind the German war effort, um, similarly you had uh, British secret societies uh, behind the war effort as well. Um, and um, 
but after after the war, uh, these secret societies basically uh, began collaborating again. And um, I, I think that uh, the, the British uh, aristocracy, uh, many of those probably have a lot of information about what's going on down in Antarctica. So, Michael, this continues. It, just in the couple of minutes we have left, this continues. We we believe that there are pyramids there. We believe that there 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 are definitely portals there. I really liked you talking about that earlier on because when people think about a planet maybe two or three million light years away, well, with the with 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 what even what we know through through the work of Einstein and even just. What, what you would call kind of mainstream scientists, Hawking and people like that. We know that time and space can be bent and can be folded, can be manipulated. So it could be possible to travel a million light years in maybe a few minutes or maybe even less than that. So all of this is there. And we have, on, you know, I've interviewed people like Timothy Good over the years and others, and they say that beings from other dimensions walk amongst us. They are here. They might be you know they might they might be on your street that you might be working with them all fascinating stuff the question i have is as we're becoming more technically advanced and by we i mean because there's there's the elite and then there's the rest of us is it becoming more difficult michael for the people that are based in antarctica is it becoming more difficult for them to conceal it i suppose that might sound like a stupid question because i'm talking to you and you're researching it, and you're bringing information out all the time, you and others. Is it getting more difficult for them to hide what they're doing? Uh, yes, that's definitely been uh, happening. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the Antarctic ice sheets being melted uh uh, by various uh, geological processes, um, and in particular, uh, uh, Antarctica's volcanic uh, system, uh, which is the largest volcanic system on Earth. It's just been uh, confirmed last year by University of Edinburgh scientists uh, that there is uh, r- roughly 130 volcanoes uh, under the ice, and they're, and they're now becoming active. And as they become active, uh, they generate a lot of th- energy, which is melting the ice, which is generating vast caverns, which is uh, creating these holes all the way from this, from the continental uh, shelf of Antarctica itself, all the way to the surface of the ice. So that's the, the holes people are seeing. So things are melting. Um, uh, some of these artifacts that are buried kind of like um, near the surface of the ice, uh, they're increasingly being exposed. Uh, you, you have uh, various uh, countries that have uh, bases on Antarctica sending teams to find these artifacts and study them. And so more and more people are learning about uh, the ancient civilizations in Antarctica, are learning about uh, some of the secret bases that are buried under the ice there. And so it's becoming harder and harder to keep it all hidden. And so I think this is where uh, very, very soon we're probably going to see some major disclosures about Antarctica, about what's been happening down there. And maybe, which is going to be the biggest shock, that that the Germans did succeed in building um, under uh, building these large uh, bases in the caverns of Antarctica. You sound so excited about it, Michael. Final question. Are are there interdimensional entities, do you believe, manipulating many of those who have been operating, many of those, let's call them humans, who have been operating in Antarctica? Is there a bit of a battle going on between interdimensional entities, do you think? Oh, yeah, that's a really important question. I mean, the whole idea of the Archons and the, and the yeah. Chimera, all of these uh, interdimensional beings. Um, yes, certainly, they, they do exist. I think there's um, – one of the things I've learned in doing this research is that you have to be really discerning. Um, definitely, there are a lot of good forces out there, good extraterrestrials, good uh, high-dimensional uh, entities, but there's also evil, malevolent ones as well that use trickery, that use deception. So, you know, there's, there's no substitute for discernment. There's no substitute for getting as much information as you can and making wise choices about who to work with and who to trust. And, uh, yeah, that's a constant process. But, yes, we need to be mindful that, you know, there are beings out there that do employ trickery and deception, and we have to be on the lookout for them all the time. 
Michael, it, it was great having you back on. It really was. Congratulations on the publication of the book. We spoke about it back in November. You were very excited about it. You sound incredibly excited, Michael. You sound like maybe, you know, I mean, when when we leave this body, we don't die, of course. So you don't have to fear death. Because somebody said to me when I spoke to you in November, one of your avid readers, they said, it must be terrible to be Michael because he must think, you know, oh, I might have 40 years left on the planet. I might have 50 and I'll die and then developments will happen or or, or revelations will, will, will come to light. But of course, that's not true because when we leave this body, we, we, of course, we don't die and our consciousness go, kind of moves on. But you sound incredibly excited about the things that are happening at the moment. Antarctica's hidden history Corporate Foundations of Secret Space Programs is Michael's new book. Go to any good online bookseller. Do go to exopolitics.org. It was a pleasure, Michael. I'm going to give you the very last word, my friend. Thanks for coming back. Final word to you. Well, well, thank you, Richie, for having me on the show and for just giving me this platform to share this information. And I think, yeah, people just pay attention what's happening in Antarctica, that might well be the, the key for understanding uh, the, the, the mystery of what's been happening over the last century or so on planet Earth. Michael, the very best of luck with the book. I'm sure it'll be received um, as well and with, with, with as much success as your previous books. Exopolitics.org, folks. And I look forward to catching up with you again this year, Michael, to talk about these issues uh, further. And we'll m- maybe develop further the interdim- inter- interdimensional entity theme and archons and that. That'd be lovely, Michael. Thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your day, my friend. Great to speak with you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha, Michael. That was Dr. Michael Sala live on the line to us there from his home in Hawaii. Exopolitics.org. Fascinating stuff, this. It really is. I'm very interested in it. My interest in it came about, I suppose, through um, speaking with people like Jim Mars and others. And, um, and I mentioned Timothy Good there. Timothy Good spoke to me many times when I, when I was based in Spain. And I was interested in it and... You know, I took a lot of it with a kind of a large grain of salt and I didn't pursue it and I was happy to talk about it. But I ultimately kind of just kind of put it to one side and was kind of dismissive, but not in a rude way. I was more kind of serving the interests of the listeners at the time, but I've become hugely interested in this field of research in um, in the last couple of years. I really have. Dr. Michael Sala. 